Uh, indeed, I'm not for the first time, opposite to the precept, I'm not the first time here in Norway. I've been across quite frequently here for events, uh, talks with you. But now for the first time it's a real thing, um, the precept in the flesh here. And okay, on one hand, of course, I would like to um, introduce a little bit the narrative about why we built this car and what happened to it. And on the other hand, I, of course, would love to emphasize as well how good it is this car finally traveling and meeting and being in the flesh, in the face of the journalists, of the customers. Because um, when we built the car and wanted to put it out in Geneva on a motor show, actually COVID-19 was just hitting Europe and the car was already on stage, installed, the whole show was built up. And then the night before the gates would have opened in Geneva, um, the show was cancelled and we have to really take, we'll take it down and bring it back home and uh, make a virtual presentation of the car. Which of course was a good thing, but what you never ever can do in virtual life is to really explore the proportion and the feel of the car. And I think one big thing about the postcard preset was really about uh, proposition, which is what we call really in the sports car arena, the way how the proportions are, how how you sit and how the car sits on the road is not like a traditional limousine. It's not the fast back of a traditional limousine. It actually is built on a on a chassis, on an architecture proposal, which is true to what we like about sports cars. What we like about sports cars is not that you have difficulties to get in and out or whatever. It is actually that you have that very special relation of how you sit with fairly stretched legs and with a steering wheel which is not in this limousine position but really in the sports car position related to your body i mean that's what's great to to experience when you sit in a 911 and that's what's great when you sit in a Porsche preset that's why this car is way below the one meter 45 that a normal limousine has which is of course quite an exercise to do when you have a battery pack underneath so it was a very clever arrangement to be done and working a lot with the seat to arrange that. All of that you can't do now because that car door doesn't open so um, that's what um, we can demonstrate in, in the other model where you can open the doors but that model is actually uh, on the way to the US um, where we will have um, an event coming soon in New York and um, yeah that, that's why we have now here the nicer car which is the white car which I like more than the matte silver car um, so here for the exterior I will concentrate on that for a while we have a situation where of course Polestar is still in developing its um, its nature I felt very much that with Polestar 1 of course which was such a direct translation of a of a Volvo sports car, a Volvo concept car, that people would need to understand where our brand would land when we have our future product portfolio, which will roll out 22, 24, where we would be when these cars are there. So that face of the car and the whole proposition shows how far away we will be from where the origins of our company are within the home of Volvo how far we would develop Polestar into a standalone individual brand expression. So we gave it the face, which we actually will have basically on the next car, the Polestar 3, on this SUV, which comes next year. So that face was, and I might ask you to follow me a bit around here. And we always said, okay, this Taurus hammer look is actually something which we will not give away. I mean, that type of really straight, great graphics, we, we will develop that second, second branch of how this develops for, in a poster way. So that's with the vertical line in it and having this very um, thin, elaborate expression of the Taurus hammer, that will be the poster interpretation of it. Then we will create a face and each face of the car obviously is like 
the human face or any anything in nature that has a face. It has eyes and a, and a mouth and that makes a face. So making just a bland white front, like a lot of electric cars are, was cars have. It was not our way. We wanted to give it a very distinct um, mouth again. And instead of making just a hole for air, we actually created that new element of a smart zone. And the smart zone is the area where we collect the sensors, the radars, and that, that are needed for the modern safety system. And it's not just simply that, that they're put there. They are really built into a unit which is not constructed like a headlight. So it's a, it's a, it's a cover there where uh, out, of, out of a perspex which is sealed like a headlight, waterproof, where all the electric components are in there. Um, this car has the wing, which brings a lateral stream close to the, uh, to the skin. That has an aerodynamic advantage. An aerodynamic advantage which is very good for high front ends. So the high front ends of an SUV that element is really, really good and that's what the Postal 3 will have. As a matter of fact, when we made this car at the end of the day, the production car, which we decided after a couple of months having toured with this car, we realized that for a low front end like this, this wing is not as beneficial. So the, the production version of the Polestar 3 set, which is then Polestar 5, we will actually not have that front end. This is very good for SUVs, but it's not very good for this type of low car. So it was good to highlight what front the Polestar 3 will have. For the production version of this car, we will actually um, not have that feature on there. It's really clear to make that a functional aerodynamic element. And if we don't need it, then we don't put it there. I mean, we don't make any fake design here. The The trend of the car industry to, of course, show that an electric car does not have this one-stop big V8 engine in there. It's leading to what we call more crack forward look. But to a certain degree, this crack forward look is taken as a design styling. If you make a screen much further forward, then really the driver can follow because at some, some point you cannot squeeze between the wheels anymore. So we are honest about that. We don't make now the most kept forward look when it's, we make it where it's technically meaningful, but we keep the rest of the crash zone as what it is. We need a certain length for crash, and that is what we show in the bonnet. So this car still has a nice length of bonnet. It has wings that you see when you sit there. So it has an honest, nice front end, which I actually feel is a very premium and great proposition for that car. And then finally here in the front, the LiDAR mounted on the roof. It's a very clear decision that our way forward to a not only autonomous drive functionality, but as well modern safety functionality that is so much enhanced with the addition of a LiDAR that we will do this with this technical element. I mean, there's this big dispute, Tesla thinks that they want to go to autonomous drive without using a LiDAR, which is actually, of course, a fairly expensive piece of technology. But we are very much convinced that it adds so much additional information, visibility, that we definitely don't want to miss out on the opportunities and the advantages that you have with this modern LiDAR. We use the LiDAR from Lumina, it's a US company, um, that developed this LiDAR that is really, really good in long range detection. So, 100, 203 meter, 300 meter ahead, they see really an incredible, precise picture of what's happening in front of you. And that information, of course, will enhance a lot the capability of the, of the computer inside, understanding what is happening in front, where is any danger coming and stuff. So at the moment, um, this is all in the 
maturing the system, really gaining the data maturity that we can introduce at then with the POSTA 3 sometime around 2024. We think that we have that system up and running that we really for the first time can do um, something like a real let go autonomous drive on a on a highway where you have fairly uh, clear conditions that you really can then yeah start reading a book whilst the, whilst the car is driving down on the highway so that's a future i have and that will be of course really really exciting one thing i have always to warn you don't expect the final car not to have a b pillar of course we will have a b pillar in that car the door that opens and you have this free view into the interior, we built that for show car reasons because it's so much easier for journalists to take a picture of the interior and stuff. So that's why that feature of a B pillarless car is, is not what, what's the meaning of uh, presenting that here. Yeah, we have um, technology wise, and I will. Just capture that for a second, what is happening there in reality. We know that to make that car this low and give it that sport and seating position, having the battery underneath, we really did not find that technology in the toolbox of the group. So there is no Volvo or Geely platform that would actually cater for that type of architecture. So when we had then the challenge or the, the nice start to think how could we put that car into production, we actually went ahead and said okay that's actually what we will invest into and since then we develop in this uh, team in uk that has all that experience with aluminum sports car we develop this technology that will carry this car and you might see that and i want to emphasize that for you please look at it we have that series going on where we make this quite honest reporting out on where we are with using this car and we have already as well shown some image of the first prototypes of the aluminum chassis where this car is actually up and running now in the UK with the very first prototypes. So this aluminum structure that we put in here is really something that will be um, a very, very good base for maybe not only that car to come and have that great sports car proportion. And there's one feature which I would like to explain to you at the rear, and that means, of course, <coughs> you would come to the rear of the car. Something which might not be totally clear in the first glance, but a lot of the aesthetics of this stunning outlandish rear, which is really what we want to put into the budget, is that this big piece of body color is only possible because we do a very special trick here. Normally, as a design and engineer, you always end up in this really, really tight squeeze space where for the inner mirror, you have to provide this view angle that you know goes just below the bar that's here at the back and somewhere where you have the rear opening going. In this space, you have to squeeze in that angle which gives you the rear vision. And that is a drama because the more you make a car aerodynamically nice flowing, the more you get into the squeeze and then the boot becomes really, really tight or then you try to make including the glass and then you get this big beam really hitting the head. So it's a total, it's a box where you never get a happy solution. There's always a really bad compromise involved. Now. We replaced the physical vision beam going back by a camera. So the picture that you will be projected or presented in the inner mirror is a screen. And that shows the camera view. And that is, of course, much bigger, much broader than you could ever do with a physical beam. And by that, we have the opportunity take out that rear window and really put the beam way behind the head so that you have really nice head room. And at the same time, what was the beam here for the opening, you kind of merge it into that one beam and you get quite a 
amazing big opening for the booth. So taking out that rear screen, replacing the vision with a camera projected image, we really gain a nice package advantage and we get the, this view of a car which is really unseen before, except maybe at the couldn't touch where actually they didn't care at all about it in, Umbro, in that respect. So that is where we really get this great uh, aesthetics and the super functionality by replacing um, the inner mirror with, with a screen. That has nothing to do with it. replacing the side wings with a screen. I mean, that is something that is still a big in discussion. Some customers like it, some don't. We have definitely legislation that for the outer mirrors is still fighting against replacing this camera in the US. That's not allowed at all. So. Uh, that's where the discussion is still going, where the future will go. But for the inner mirror, that is something which is absolutely fine and legal and no um, harm is that. So that's how we um, have a technical speciality coming here, which we will as well put into production for some fun. Yeah, we have a couple of um, materials collected here on the table. And I might maybe ask for some help if you could have me this, this stuff, and then I don't have to ask you to move again and annoy you with chasing you around. Whatever. Um, yes, this is about what materials we use in the interior. Just one after the other would uh, take a lot. Um, and of course, what we had as a mission is to show a really, really cool, nice modern interior. With materials that have, of course, the ambition to be a big step in terms of sustainable interiors. You know, every material that we put in a car has a CO2 carbon footprint. And of course, the more we ignore that, the more you get a high CO2 burden into the car. Now, this, for example, is seat material. It's a, what we call 3D knit. It's a very structural material, something that you see on sport shoes a lot. Um, yeah, I don't see them now here, um, but this is a technology where you, in, in, one, in, in, in one machine, can create 3D shapes um, and they, of course, use material that is the, the other material with a, a broken pet bottle that is produced out of uh, recycled pet bottles, this yarn that is woven then into this uh, 3D knit. This material here, which looks like carbon fiber, is not carbon fiber. It's actually the uh, what is BCOM material. It's a technology where um, yeah, that flower there over there, flux. I don't know what. Uh, I mean, that's it's it's a very uh, simple um, field flower. Uh, this this flux which can be then typical um, Nordic. Sorry? It's typical Nordic. Yeah, it's actually, well, European kind or of, European. I mean. And, and indeed, it's a material when we, if we would go and produce the similar materials somewhere else, we would actually have to look what is actually the typical material similar to it, which is homegrown there. And you kind of uh, weave it into yarn and use it as a structural material that you put into the back of this as a, as a, as a net that's stabilizing um, the weave. And similar stiffness and similar lightness to carbon fiber, you get out of that composite material made out of this uh, flux material. That's what we use a lot in um, the precept interior for the hardbacks of the seats, for the uh, big panels that are cladding the doors and the tunnel and of course this is material that normally you use a lot of plastics and of course it urges now to really reduce the virgin plastic the virgin oil based plastic and use recycled materials or uh, natural grown materials like the flux yeah so these are two um, examples of what work is happening in the interior of this car but not only of the preset but really what we put into production and that's where the big 
chunk of work is, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of ideas for new materials in cars, but to really make that a producible thing where you have in an industrial way and with the lifespan of a car, which obviously is designed to last at least eight, nine, ten years, that those materials are really withstanding the, 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 the challenges of time. That is really the problem. And us developing this now into production is really very big R&D work over two, three, four years in order to make it possible that this actually will be in production. So that's the work that's ongoing with uh, this nice show car. And of course, you can imagine, I mean, that will be uh, an incredible time when this car is out. We have already the Polestar 3 and 4 on the road, the two SUVs, and um, all of that is happening in the next three, four years. So by the by 25, all of this should be in production and up and running. And of course, we're very excited about uh, this future ahead, um, despite the fact that it's uh, incredible challenges and the amount of work still uh, to be tackled. But um, yeah, we believe it's really worthwhile and um, part of our of our development of Polestar. So that's what the preset was supposed to communicate, to give you a glimpse of where we will be in a couple of years. And of course, to make you as well um, excited and supportive for that story. Thanks a lot for your attention here this morning. And welcome to Polestar. <laughs>